project, ideally this will develop into a book, uh, in which I tentatively titled uh, Fabric of Monasticism, Buddhism in the Silk Cultures of Medieval China. Uh, of course, this is uh, predominantly a uh, study of Buddhist material culture, a uh, study of all the ways in which uh, Buddhist teachings and doctrines and practices and so on have been manifested through and shaped by material agents. Uh, that is, monasteries, altars, uh, icons, ritual elements, and of course the bodies of Buddhist monks and nuns. And now in the, in the context of uh, medieval China, all of these different material forms were notably enmeshed with silk. That's the project. Uh, silk was the uh, fabric of Chinese civilization, was the primary staple of Chinese material culture uh, for thousands of years. So then, of course, when Buddhism arrives, this silk culture deeply influences what Buddhism becomes in the Chinese context. And likewise, uh, Buddhist teachings and practices deeply influence the development of silk culture and silk, silk technology in China. So it's this interaction between these two that uh, is the driving force uh, behind this project. Which I've been investigating again for a couple of years now, and this, this, it's a, it's a long-term project, which I expect will take me uh, at least another decade uh, to get this book out. So I wanted to, uh, to next give you a little bit of background as to where this uh, particular project uh, came from. Here, uh, I, I know Christoph, uh, at least has read it, but uh, my, my book that I published a few years ago now in 2015, uh, Conceding the Indian Buddhist Patriarchs in China, uh, was broadly about um, how medieval Chinese Buddhists represented the ancient Indian origins of their religion. Um, now, Chinese Buddhist sources provide uh, the most robust picture available in any body of Buddhist literature about ancient Indian Buddhism. So, typically, then, scholars will mine these sources, these Chinese sources, about ancient India in order to study the history, uh, the philosophy of Indian Buddhism itself. Uh, but instead, I'm using in this book, I'm using these Chinese sources not to study ancient India, but to study the beliefs and concerns of Chinese Buddhists themselves, how they sought to represent ancient India, and how their representations of it would serve local interests uh, in medieval China in various ways. Um, so this, this kind of line of thinking broadly, this interpretive strategy of reading Chinese Buddhist sources as reflecting Chinese Buddhist realities more so than the context that they attempt to depict. This interpretive approach also informs the, the current, at least mention of the Silk Project uh, that I'll uh, present to you today. Um, so the, the interpretive strategy is one uh, area of influence that's developed into the current project. Um, and then, uh, well, I guess more approximately, the reason I got into this uh, Silk Project uh, was one case study that I worked on for one particular chapter of this book uh, concerning the author of these Buddhist biographies that um, at least a couple of uh, our colleagues have studied, uh, the, the, the Ashtabhosha and the uh, Buddha Charita. So working on the case of Ashtabhosha in China is what sort of got me into this, this uh, so project. Um, so Ashtabhosha, as you know, uh, ancient Indian Buddhist master, uh, probably you know, deemed typically a historical figure, probably lived in the first to the second century uh, CE. He's associated with the famous uh, Ushan King Kanishka, author of the Buddha Charita, a uh, great uh, Sanskrit poet, and so on. Uh, but here we see this is a, a medieval Japanese iconographic drawing of Ashtarosha in a very different form as the god of silk and sericulture. And this is a transformation that I trace back through textual sources in the book. Uh, to sometime during the Tang Dynasty in China, uh, maybe around the 8th or 9th century. And then the main research question, so I see this, as you observe this transformation into this, uh, of this character into this silkworm deity, and the question arises, the research question is, why? Why him? Why Ashtadosha? Why would this guy in particular become this god of silk? Well, the short answer is, he's connected to horses. Uh, I'll explain that <laughs> in a little bit. Uh, but his name, Ashwagosha, literally means something like horse nay, uh, and is translated uh, directly like that into the Chinese almost always uh, as a name, rather than being transliterated into long strings of Chinese characters as Indian names often were. So from a Chinese perspective, he, he was the, this horse nay guy. Um, 
<laughs> um, and then in the, in actually I found a couple of sources in I'm not sure how far they go back to the um, or even earlier that uh, uh, textual sources that describe him in this form iconographically. So he's, he's uh, writing, he rides a white horse. Uh, and then the, the later uh, Japanese again iconographic, iconographic drawings that they will find also illustrate him drawing, riding this white horse. So again, yeah, the horse connection is very, very influential in this connection. And let me explain uh, that, the ancient Chinese connections between the horse and the silkworm. So this is a depiction of it's a late imperial block print illustration of the uh, Chinese Sarah culture pantheon. Uh, it's centered at the top here. So yeah, I'm not sure. It's centered at the top. There it is. Uh, right here. Uh, by the Xiling. Right there. Uh, defined here as the Shitan, uh, the first sericulturist, maybe. Uh, although I think it's actually more interesting to translate it as the first silkworm. Uh, I think there's some interesting analogies drawn in some of the literature between insects and people, uh, especially uh, divinities of sorts. Uh, anyway, so, so it centers on this Lei Shi Ling as the first uh, silkworm, the first sericulturist. Uh, another important figure is over here on the left. This is Lei Yang Yu, uh, who was uh, earlier, earlier periods in history also known as this first silkworm. Uh, and then we have this figure over here on the right, uh, Mahomian, uh, the horse head maiden. And these three, in particular, were kind of the, uh, uh, the main sericulture deities uh, throughout much of Chinese history, uh, along with uh, several others. And these are all these characters are all described in ancient Chinese myths as the progenitors, the originators of silk production and sericulture uh, in China. Uh, and also, as early as the uh, Shang period, as evidenced by oracle bone inscriptions, uh, there seems to have been uh, worship or, or sacrifices offered to uh, in a kind of amorphous uh, silkworm deity or a uh, tansha. And here's uh, this, this uh, binomial appears in the oracle bones of here generally for all of these ceremonial deities. Uh, and then here down below, we have a uh, figure uh, performing a ritual of veneration to these silk, uh, silkworm deities. Looks like he's offering uh, incense there between. Uh, twigs of mulberry branches, most likely. Mulberry trees were, of course, the primary food of the Bombyx mori species of silkworm that predominated in China. Uh, and here on the left, perhaps offering some looks like sack of cocoons uh, that we offer as sacrifice to the silkworm deities. Uh, so this is probably, probably a sericulturist down here, uh, not at the official imperial level, um, maybe more of a folk religious practice or a popular religious practice, practice however you would define that. Uh, but there were also uh, official, uh, at the state level, at the imperial level, uh, official uh, sericulture sacrifices or ceremonies performed that were presided over uh, by the emperor's wives uh, and other court ladies uh, in order to accompany uh, the emperor's annual agricultural rites uh, performed by the state. And so these, these sericulture rites at the state level were performed at least uh, from the Han uh, through Song times. And they're described in the uh, Li Ji and the Zhou Li, uh, you know, maybe around the first few centuries BC or CE. Uh, so they go back quite far. Uh, and then again, getting back to the, uh, the horse connections, sericulture and uh, horses, we have again this figure, this Mahonyang, I'll talk about uh, her in a little bit, her origin story. Uh, also closely links to the silkworm and the horse. And then we see over the top here this um, constellation of the uh, the Tianzi the Xin. Uh, the heavenly team of four horses constellation uh, was at its apex at the night sky in the spring equinox when the sericulture season would usually begin. Uh, so because of these sort of astronomical connections with this constellation and this rising over the night sky when it's time to harvest your worms, uh, then there were some who would, who would state that silkworms and horses therefore share the same sheep. And then, as a result, we have some discussions according to which um, silkworms and horses actually looked alike. Uh, they behaved similarly, they kind of like kind of bob their heads. If you've ever seen a silkworm cruising around, it like kind of does this horse sort of thing. <laughs> uh, so we have, we have uh, one, one common example is the ancient Confucian philosopher uh, Xinzi, uh, who describes this relationship between the horse and the silkworm uh, in such ways. So then, um, getting back to this uh, horse head maiden, 
Um, here, uh, the story I'll tell here is the earliest source we found it is the uh, Sao Shanxi, uh, the fourth century. Uh, this is the uh, most famous uh, Chinese story uh, about silkworms and provides a, a mythic etiology or an origin story of uh, silk and silkworms and sericulture. And this origin story prominently includes a horse, as we can see in this later Japanese uh, illustration of it. Um, so this story tells of a girl who lives at home with her father and her horse. And uh, her father goes off on a journey and he's gone for a really long time, so the daughter begins to worry. She asks the horse if the horse can go off and find her father. And she promises the horse that if he does, uh, she will marry the horse. The, uh, the horse succeeds then, and he finds the father, brings the father home, and is expecting uh, marriage. But then the, uh, the girl reneges on her promise. She refuses then, of course, to marry the horse. Uh, later, the father finds out about this arrangement that his daughter had made with the horse. So he's angry about it. And so he kills the horse. He slays it with an arrow, and he, he skins it, and he takes the horse hide, and he lays it out in, in a courtyard to dry. So then the scene shifts. The, the woman's, the girl's out there with the, the horse hide laying on the ground, and she's like mocking it and kicking it and telling it what an idiot it was to think they could actually marry a human woman. And so with that, the horse hide leaps up and wraps around the girl, as you can see there, and then flies off. And the horse and the, and the girl are later found uh, in the limbs of a mulberry tree. Uh, again, um, pointedly, the primary food for silkworms are found in the limbs of a mulberry tree, having transformed into the world's first silkworm, uh, spinning itself a uh, cocoon. So, against this backdrop, with the story of the, the horse head maiden, uh, with these you know, prominent horse and silkworm connections, we can uh, perhaps better understand one early important uh, hagiography of the Indian master Ashwagosha, uh, getting back to uh, his case. Uh, so there's this, this hagiography of him that appears in the uh, Bali and Juan. Uh, so it's the very beginning of the ninth century, uh, and it provides a hagiography of Ashwagosha, which appears nowhere prior to that, that was repeated in many sources, especially China sources thereafter, uh, which build on uh, Bali and Juan. So then according to this, uh, Ashwagosha gets a story of his past lives from the Buddha himself, and the Buddha tells it. Among your former lives, you were once born in Brahma heaven, but because of your attachments, you were reborn in the kingdom of Vaishali. Uh, there are people there who have no clothing, and whose body grew hair like horses. Although they have mouths, they cannot understand speech. You gave rise to compassion, so transform yourself into a small insect and body of body in the millions. Atop the trees, there you eat leaves, and in less than ten days, you produced cocoons. So then the uh, story continues. The bodies of the lowest class of people there had the appearance of horses, and they were called horse people. They gathered the cocoons from atop the trees and used them to produce clothing. In this land, such cocoons are spun by silk or larvae. Because the horse people of the whole kingdom were able to produce clothing, and you enabled them to obtain this benefit, you were reborn in the kingdom of Majadesha. When you previously left the kingdom of Vaishali, the horse people were overcome with emotions, so they all cried out in grief. You were destined to turn the Dharma wheel, become the twelfth patriarch in succession. Because of your emotional response to the cries and grief of the horse people, you were called horseman or Ashtagoshi. So this tale, first of all, here provides a, a, an explanation for his unique name. He was called Horsene because there were these horse people in the kingdom there in India who cried at his uh, departure. There are also clear analogies here between the, with this story and the story of a horse head maiden, uh, La Pinyan from the uh, Social uh, with these uh, silkworm horse connections and this dramatic and uncanny metamorphosis that mirrors the transformation of the silkworm moth itself. Uh, but mostly this story here, this hagiography, is a story of the bodhisattva's sacrifice to help the suffering, to ease the suffering of uh, sentient beings. In this case, uh, the bodhisattva does so uh, per, by providing silk and silk clothing for the destitute masses, or for the horse people. And though the story here isn't so clear on this point, this would have required his death. This is the Bodhisattva self-sacrifice, the greatest gift of, of, of one's own body in order to save sentient suffering sentient beings. So to see how that would have been the case and why this would have required his death and uh, self-sacrifice, it's uh, useful to step back a little bit uh, to understand how uh, silkworms produce their silk and what happens to them as they do. Um, 
So, when I was in uh, elementary school, I don't know if you do this elsewhere, but um, we raised silkworms, and, and uh, we, we, we you know, go through the process, we have little worms, and then we give the leaves to eat. And so we did this as, as, you know, as a six-year-old kid or whatever. <laughs> um, so if you have not done it, let me explain briefly how this works. Uh, although, although we did not kill them then, we let them go. Um, here, however, in this case, many, many are killed, and that's the problem. All right, so um, beginning here from the egg stage, at top they hatch and they go through several molting stages. Uh, and then let's see, after they, they start spinning themselves a cocoon after about a month from hatching from their eggs. Um, inside that cocoon they'll transform into a pupa. Uh, and then after about, what, uh, four days or so, they'll secrete a resin that will allow them to break through the, uh, the cocoon, transform into moths, fly off, maybe even create more eggs, and then you keep going on that way forever. Um, however, this uh, breaking through here from the moth destroys what is otherwise a single filament of silk that winds for as much as a thousand meters around that one cocoon. Um, you can use it if it's broken through like that, but it creates much more small silk, so I think you want to keep it all as a single attack filament. Uh, so then the pupae inside would have to be killed uh, before it could transform into a moth and break through. They would do so by boiling or steaming. Uh, I'll show you an image of that. Um, uh, in order to prevent that destruction of the cocoon. Um, so here, um, it's obviously not medieval or ancient China, but this is a depiction of a process that is illustrated in uh, ancient Chinese sources of boiling the cocoon, cocoons, often in an alkaline solution to dissolve the dung that surrounds the cocoon. I'll show you that uh, detail in a little bit. Um, but uh, Buddhist sources as well, and we'll, we'll read um, uh, some examples of this this week, describe the popping and squealing of the little worms as they go through this boiling process. Um, one reviewer of that article asked me at one point, do they actually pop and squeal? Um, and my, my, my response was, I actually don't know, but I think not. Um, I, I think it likely would, would have been what was heard, was that like, if you have a closed uh, pocket that's being heated, it'll kind of like, like kind of a little fizzling sort of sound. I think that's likely what the, the sound it would make. Uh, but it's anyways described the Buddhist sources as the worms like screaming in distress at their suffering and death. Uh, so we'll read some examples of that. If you uh, let them break through, then this is what you get. Uh, so again, that single filament that winds around the entire cocoon is broken into several little fragments. And again, you can still boil this down, these broken cocoons, you can still boil them down and create uh, what, what's called um, a um, We'll look at the terminology in a little bit, the, you know, kind of fragments that then, then you could spin them all together to create, a, to create yarns and threads with them, but they have all these little junctures in them that would create overall a much poor quality silk. Uh, so I really want to keep them intact. So, Against this backdrop, again, we can uh, ideally uh, better understand what's going on in the case of not only Hashimoto, but how the entirety of the sericulture industry is reinvented through this simple narrative of Hashimoto's past life as these um, you know, self-sacrificing bodhisattva who transforms into silvers to make silver. Um, so according to the, uh, the Bali Juan, Instead of being hapless victims of slaughter, silkworms are now great bodhisattvas. Instead of being a product of death, here silk represents the compassion and the generosity of the bodhisattva path and the bodhisattva vows. Sariculture is no longer a murderous enterprise, according to this representation of Ashvarosha, but it is instead a glorious sacrifice, the greatest gift. And silk producers themselves enable this bodhisattva vow to be fulfilled. And now India becomes the homeland of sericulture. And this is really striking against the backdrop of numerous uh, Chinese sericulture myths uh, that ascribe its invention to the ancient Chinese sage kings and deities who were the progenitors of classical Chinese civilization. Right? According to ancient Chinese sources, Silk is something like a synecdote for China, uh, whereas here it becomes ancient Indian innovation as well, or instead. So then I read this as a process of intentionally uh, making silk Indian 
making it Buddhist and making it a bodhisattva's innovation, which would then ideally, from a kind of socioeconomic standpoint, make the sericulture industry under the purview of the Buddhist uh, institution, uh, Saga in China. So this is a, an overview of the where I had been and what I had, you know, how I had gotten into this whole uh, Silicon Buddhism uh, nexus. And, and working on this, just this one case uh, showed to me that there's really so much, such an enormous topic uh, of Buddhism in, in silk culture uh, that it certainly lends itself to an entire book project. Um, so that's where I am. Um, and in order to understand um, this nexus of relationships between Buddhism and silk culture, it's useful to have some background on uh, what silk culture is, its history, its technology. I mean, I think our ideal here in this case would be to understand silk and its production and its history and its technology to the extent that someone like Dao Shen would have understood. And we'll, we'll read some of his writings, and we'll see he had a pretty good grasp on this, I think. Um, we'll, you know, we'll see some examples of medieval Chinese commentators such as Dao Shen, who demonstrate uh, some kind of a techn technological awareness of the industry. So I think we'd want to have a, at least an equal amount of knowledge of what silk was in China. Uh, so we'll try to provide a little bit of that today. Just as a, as a brief starting point for that, um, silk has at least 7,000 years of history in China. Um, the earliest, uh, it's evidence first archaeologically, of course. Um, the earliest evidence is uh, weaving implements and, and looms and things that date to something like 5000 BC. Um, and we have the earliest extent fragments of actual silk uh, date to something like 3500 BC, uh, though there may be an example of something earlier than that. I'll show you uh, in a little bit. Um, in Chinese sources, as well as Western sources, silk is, uh, or China is typically credited with the, the invention of uh, sericulture, uh, the domestication of the silkworm. Uh, it's described again as a cornerstone of Chinese civilization, a staple of its material culture, both in Chinese sources and the West. In uh, Western discourse, uh, English words, silk, for example, may be, uh, though this may be something for Christoph to weigh in on, uh, whether the modern word, word silk is it's sometimes suggested <coughs> derives uh, from, the, from the old Chinese pronunciation of the modern si, or silk. Uh, ancient Greek and Latin terms for China maybe translate as something like the land of silk. Um, and then Chinese Buddhist authors as well, uh, maybe we'll see some examples this week, uh, describe silk as something like a silk, though for China, silk is representative of the entirety of China's uh, civilization. Um, this image on the right here, I just wanted to, um, especially since um, I'm, I'm on videotape, I wanted to thank uh, the, uh, um, the Antonio Ratti Textile Center at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, where I was able to uh, go in there, this was last spring, they gave me access to, this, this, this example here is a 15th century uh, Japanese Buddhist robe um, using a weaving technique that appears to uh, date back to uh, ancient times in, in China. Uh, but you can see it's a, a kind of gold paper, very thin slices of gold affixed to uh, paper strips. Uh, and you can see that as the left weave, they're interwoven in their gold um, uh, throughout that. Um, and then otherwise, you know, very intricate, uh, delicate uh, weave. This is a 16 times magnification. There's a fun little tool that you can attach to your iPad um, a little camera and you can hold it over the textile and take photographs of this magnification. It's kind of fun um, to show you their tricks. And they also um, show me all, if you want to check this out, this is one of the little magnifiers that they'll like just a kind of hand tool with the textile uh, sciences people will carry around in their pocket everywhere they go. And so I got one. It's only $8. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has a little light switch on it too. You like look at your clothes up close, it's kind of fun. Um, so anyway, that's what I was able to do there. Um, okay. So, in China, silk was, the silk industry was enormous. Um, we have widespread domestication of silkworms across all regions of China, massive production of silk, um, empire-wide scale pretty much through most of the imperial Chinese history. I'll break that down for you as we go along the later today. Uh, the vast majority of the populace was involved, and I think it would be a little exaggeration to say that just about every Chinese subject uh, throughout, especially in medieval times, was some, somewhere in a 
involved in the city, uh, from emperors uh, on down to peasants, um, especially those with working classes and farmers uh, and several trades. It was just enormous. Um, as we might expect, then, uh, we'll get into this terminology in more depth uh, later today. But of course, silk in China is not one thing. It is many, many things. Uh, and we're, we're doing the kind of uh, sort of textual research that I'm trying to engage in this project. You have to have a good, firm grasp of um, really at least dozens, if not hundreds, of different Chinese terms for different kinds of mediums, uh, different kinds of structures, different kinds of decorations of Chinese silks. Uh, so it's just enormous, enormous variety, uh, which we'll, we'll have to get into and we'll do again, a little bit of that, uh, this terminology later today. <clears throat> so that's the, 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 the textile history and silk culture and history uh, fields, is the research world that I've gotten myself into for the past uh, uh, couple of years. Um, and, you know, again, I do so because that's the world in which medieval Chinese Buddhists lived. Uh, at least in part, uh, Chinese Buddhism was born and raised in the land of silk, and it was defined in part by it, I argue, uh, by practices of adorning uh, monastic bodies and monastic precincts with silk, by receiving enormous quantities of it as alms. I think dana, the concept of dana, Buddhist uh, generosity and giving, is certainly one of the most important driving forces uh, in, in the silk industry uh, through medieval times. And a Buddhist trade in it, uh, and they even produce it. So we found some examples of uh, Buddhist production, especially the enemies of, uh, of silk in China. Um, so, this is all evidence in several places. This is the, the close connection between Buddhism and silk, is evidenced in the Chinese secular record, for one. Um, these these uh, examples here are the earliest uh, extent uh, Chinese secular sources that refer to Buddhist monks and to Buddhist monasteries in the uh, Ho Han Shu and the San Wu Chur. Um, and these uh, references both prominently associate Buddhism with silk. Um, these connections between Buddhism and silk are also uh, evidenced much in the, uh, the Buddhist textual record, and we'll be looking at uh, some of those examples this week, as well as the, uh, the material, uh, the archaeological record, uh, which I'll try to introduce to you uh, today. So if we imagine what, in medieval China, a, at least a fairly well-appointed uh, Buddhist monastery would look like. Um, and we'll see, we'll certainly see examples today from Dunhuang and from Bavansi, uh, the, the examples where we have most of the material evidence uh, remaining. But I think if we imagine from these case studies, if we imagine what a, what a well-appointed Buddhist monastery would look like in medieval China, it would be covered in silk. Um, for example, we have, we have many examples of these kinds of wall hangings um, found in Dunhuang. Uh, this is an example of a, a Shakyamuni preaching on Vulture Peak. This thing is almost eight feet tall, uh, so it would have covered the majority of a, of a, of a temple wall. So we, there are several examples of this. I'll show you more as we go along. Uh, but I mentioned these various hanging banners on the walls. Um, otherwise, uh, banners for processions um, or other events. Um, Many, many examples of these found in the and elsewhere, uh, painted on silk or embroidered in silk and so on. The altars. Altars were typically covered in silk. Uh, we only have a few examples of extent uh, from Dunhuang of the literature and also uh, paintings from the you know, you know, Dunhuang caves, uh, very illustrative of uh, the use of these silk covers over altars. They're called valences, altar valence. Uh, so we have the walls covered in silk, we have the altars covered in silk. Uh, we have Buddha images uh, covered in silk. This, this example here is a uh, late imperial uh, from the China National Silk Museum in Hangzhou, the Qing Dynasty, but we have uh, discussions of this, uh, mentions of this throughout the sources of adorning icons or gifting silks to statues uh, and so on. And sutras. So we have our monastery walls are covered with silk, our altars, our Buddhist images, and then, of course, um, Buddhist scriptures. Uh, one prominent example is uh, Sutra ties. We have lots of these left over from Dunhuang. Talk a little more about those later. Um, sutra wrappers. This here, this one here is also from Dunhuang. It is in the 8th century. You usually fit about 10 scrolls or so per wrapper, and uh, these serve several functions. We'll talk more about this, but 
sutras are tied in silk and then wrapped in silk. Might be interesting to, to explore potential analogies here with the cocoon. The scriptures are wrapped in silk like the pupa is wrapped in the cocoon. And there's also analogies that have been drawn with the mortuary practice of wrapping corpses in silk to enable some sort of a transformation, so much like uh, silkworms will go through their metamorphosis inside of the cocoon. Sutras are as well are covered in silk. This example was uh, uh, a later one from the Yuan Dynasty. I think found in Fa and Su, but uh, you see the silk brocade cover on this accordion style sutra, otherwise uh, ink on paper. And then this is a this is a just a magnificent example. It's one of uh, very few that we've got uh, from the medieval period of a sutra woven entirely in the warp left design of the textile uh, in silk. Um, it's uh, based in the 10th century, as we can, we can see the date there on the left. Um, it's uh, an example of the Diamond Sutra. Um, and just the, uh, it's going to take years to, to complete. It's over 5,000 characters. It's over 23 feet long. Um, this thing all woven in, in uh, gold and, and indigo uh, thread. Um, so just the intent, I mean, imagine the intense devotion that would be required to to create this. And you know, so you see so this devotional practices are manifested through, they're actualized in and shaped by silk. So monasteries, altars, icons, scriptures, monks. <laughs> Wrapped in silk. Um, so here's a, here's a painting of the uh, famous uh, Chai Monk Wujun uh, Shifan of the 13th century. And of course, in the painting, you can't know the material of his garments. Uh, but it looks to be a fairly nice silken kashaya, or kasaks, in the monastic robe that he's gone on. Um, and this would appear to be verified um, by an extent kashaya uh, that is purportedly a possession of the same Chai Monk Wujun Shifan. Uh, which is held at Rinzai uh, Temple Shodenji in Kyoto. Uh, so apparently we have his, his massive robe left behind and it is of a, a silk construction. Here's another interesting example. Uh, let's see, this one is um, held at uh, Enyakuji, uh, also near Kyoto. This is the so-called rag garment associated with the famous 6th century Chinese monk Chu. Um, whether this was actually Juri's or not is of course questionable, but it uh, claims to be as such, but it is nonetheless a, a, a fairly old textile that is likewise composed of comprised of silk. And then one example I came across recently of a, 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 a monk who uh, uh, died in Fujian in uh, 2012 and then was uh, this is the lacquering and mummification process, uh, but then uh, wrapped in silk. Um, and as I mentioned, mortuary practice. In China, typically involves silk. Horses are often wrapped in silk garments. Uh, and it's also likened to the, uh, the Buddhist example of uh, adorning uh, icons with uh, silk garments, good statues. Um, so, this is introduction by way of all the things that I don't actually do. Um, these are the things that I've taught myself doing my, my second PhD on my own in the past few years. Um, what I do instead is this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an art historian. I read Chinese Buddhist texts uh, and try to interpret them in these contexts that we can otherwise solidify through the material record. Um, this is just one example of the kind of stuff that I've been producing over the past couple of years. Um, these databases full of references. Um, I'm pretty much just starting with uh, the, the, the Taisho and the Zonkizokyo. And even there, thousands of references, just scattered through everything of all the different silk terms. Um, and so, you know, through this process, you know, constructing these databases, I've been able to kind of extract. It's difficult because there are no singular sources. Like, there's no book that talks about, this is a silk book. There's no such thing. Um, there is no, like, dedicated source to silk and sericulture in the canon. Instead, it's scattered throughout every single text of the Buddhist canon. So I'm now in this position where I have to read everything. Um, and so I'm doing this, I'm constructing these databases with excerpts of uh, discussions and, um, and from that, you know, stepping back to interpret and analyze and that's what we'll be doing uh, in this workshop.